herb. Herb is a plant. I mean, herbs are good for everything. Hey, you got Dank with Eugene Cannabis TV. I'm your host. I got interesting news stories for you from Oregon and all over the country. <clears throat> Just came back from our hemp fest. It was a great time, a little damp, but it was certainly a big success. Big plans for next year. <clears throat> you know, we got our banner out, Just uh, our legalize it banner. I always like to point out and I always like to say re-legalize it because a lot of people don't realize that it was legal at one time and it was made illegal. So... But anyway, <clears throat> that is the call to legalize it. And speaking of which, we have an initiative, OCTA, OCTA 2012, which uh, they are gathering signatures for to legalize adult use uh, for uh, adults of cannabis. And uh, they were hired, they had hired some petition uh, gatherers, and they were up to 20, I believe, 27,000 signatures. However, they <clears throat> ran into a money shortage and they had to lay off their... Uh, hired crew so now it's uh, the completely volunteer effort so if you're interested in helping uh, grab the signatures uh, for an initiative uh, go to the thcfoundation.org website thf that's thc foundation uh, and you can get the information there or you can also google this octa 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 2012 and you'll get get the information you need we certainly could use some help on that one. Uh, here's an interesting story we came across. This is in Southern Oregon, Williams, Oregon. The title is Tiny Town Tops in Medical Marijuana. It says, Medical Marijuana has taken root in this idyllic town like nowhere else in Oregon. Nearly 20% of the population is registered to grow pot legally, and an untold number deals it illegally, creating stark contrasts in a... Uh, Bolikburg, Bol Bol where children still ring the bell to start the school day and pancake breakfast draw a crowd at the local, uh, local community center. The Associated Press <clears throat> analyzed the locations of registered pot grower in Oregon based on their zip codes and found that Williams so far has the heaviest concentration. More than 400 of the town's 2,000 residents are authorized by the state to grow up to six plants each. The proliferation of pot became the talk of the town last summer when new Google Earth satellite images showed little green circles in neat rows all over the valley. My, my daughter showed me on her iPhone, said Neil uh, Sennett, owner of, the, of a local cafe. She said, Dad, look what our neighbors are doing. <laughs> uh, Six-foot-tall fences that screen uh, marijuana gardens from public view have become so common that a local pasture uses them as landmarks for giving directions. One resident is trying to capitalize on the growing popularity of medical marijuana by starting a testing lab. A variety of marijuana grown there called Williams Wonder is cherished among pot connoisseurs. So uh, it says the number of people authorized to grow for others has also mushroomed from 12,274 in 2006 to 26,734. So that's over twice as much in four years. Uh, the number jumped from 100, see, uh, in Williams, the number jumped from 122 to 301 in the same period, <laughs> which is <clears throat> close to three times. Anyway, uh, why has pot become so big in Williams? <clears throat> the reason seemed to be a combination of an ideal climate remote and rural location, and a willingness to live and let live. Southwestern Oregon sits in the northern tip of the Emerald Triangle, one of the nation's best growing, uh, marijuana growing regions, which stretches into Northern California. Pot has been grown here since California hippies started moving in during the 70s. When Oregon's medical marijuana effect took effect in 99, a lot of those guys got their cards and came out of the woods and started doing it legally, said Keith Mansour editor of the Oregon Cannabis Connection, a newspaper devoted to marijuana issues based in nearby Medford. Laird Funk is a longtime activist who lost his job running the sewage treatment plant 
in nearby Grants Pass several years ago after testing positive for marijuana. Funk, now the chairman of the State Medical Marijuana Advisory Committee, says the weather is conductive to growing pot, but securing the crop can become complicated. It's not hard to do out here in the sunshine, he said. Everybody does some variation of security. Some people can use chain links, some solid wood. Some people dress up like Vietnam and walk around with guns. But you can kill people like that, so I don't. <laughs> Williams took its name from an Indian fighter during the gold rush of the 1850s. After the gold played out, logging and dairy farms also waned. Now the valley is a mix of organic farmers, people cobbling together living from odd jobs, mushroom picking, and California retirees and commuters. So that's our uh, southern Oregon and down to Williams. So uh, it shows how prevalent it is down there. And uh, <clears throat> this is a, uh, uh, it was a letter uh, to the editor in response to a paper, article in a paper that was down that area. This is from Caleb Greentree, a friend of ours that runs a, an organization here locally, which is the uh, Help and Hope, uh, or, uh, see, the Help and Hope, Help, Help and Hope. Anyway, it says, marijuana is a relatively safe, effective medicine. It would be nice if Oregon had a regulated supply system so, so that patients and their physicians could benefit from knowing the precise strength of the active ingredients. Most people don't know that marijuana contains more than one cam cannabinoid, which are, that are medically effective. The THC and CBD are both measurable and have different medical effects. Research shows that the combination is often more effective than either cannabinoid uh, alone. That is why natural marijuana is better than synthetic THC in the form of a marinol pill sold by pharmaceutical companies and available at pharmacies. Over 3,500 Oregon doctors have qualified their patients for medical marijuana. Its usefulness as a medicine is undeniable. Unfortunately, the current law requires patients to produce their own medicine. We need a regulated system with clear rules. Until we have that, places like the ones rated provide an important needed service for suffering patients. The story presented this from the police viewpoint. I hope the Herald and News covers the story when the DA determines that no crime was committed or when the people are found not guilty. The only connection between marijuana and meth is the marijuana laws that wrongly categorize marijuana with truly dangerous drugs like meth. Whoever did it, thank you. So that's uh, <coughs> uh, a good point. It brings us to excellent points there uh, that... Uh, they try to connect marijuana and meth together and talk about being drugs and how they're bad, and there's definitely no connection between the two. In fact, a lot of they're finding that uh, actually meth, or excuse me, marijuana is actually helping uh, a lot of people get off the really hard drugs. Uh, Willie Nelson said on a 60 minute segment a number of years ago, he said, if it wasn't for marijuana, I wouldn't have been able to quit the, the drugs that were really giving me problems uh, alcohol and tobacco. So, uh, and then another thing, this is out of California, our friend Eddie Lepp. Uh, Eddie Lepp is uh, a big name in the movement, a, a heck of a guy and, and a, a real believer in the movement. Uh, he is now, uh, well, I'll explain it to you, a federal appeals court upheld the conviction and 10-year sentence Wednesday of a medical marijuana advocate who grew 32,000 pot plants for patients and fellow Rastafarians on his land in Lake County. The federal judge who sent Charles Eddie Lepp to prison in 2009 criticized the federal law that required a 10-year term for growing at least 1,000 marijuana plants. But U.S. District Judge Marilyn Hall Patel of San Francisco said she was bound by the law and the Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals agreed. The statutory minimum sentence is not cruel and unusual punishment, the three-judge panel said. Federal agents arrested Lepp in 2004 after finding the marijuana plants in gardens near his home in Upper Lake, most of them in view of Highway 20. He said the plants were for patients who had a right to use marijuana with their doctor's approval under California law. Lepp also said he was a Rastafarian minister for whom marijuana is a sacrament and that he was growing the plants for 2,500 members of his church who, are, who were sharecroppers. Federal law strictly bans marijuana, however, even in states that allow its medical use. The appeals court upheld Patel's refusal to allow Lepp to invoke his religion as a defense to the charges. 
saying his prosecution served the government's compelling interest in preventing diversion of sacramental marijuana to non-religious users. Lepp's lawyer, Michael Hickley, had argued that the 10-year sentence was grossly disappropriate to the crimes. Hinckley said that he was disappointed by Wednesday's ruling and that the thought of him spending 10 years in prison in circumstances like this is tragic. And it really is. Uh, Eddie Lepp, uh, he, came, he was, uh, came to our HempFest, uh, I think 2008, I think it was. He oh, actually he was here to open our event, which is a real honor for us. Uh, and I have his address here, uh, which if you'll send us an email, I can get that to you if you'd like to write to him in prison and, and try to cheer him up. Uh, I'm definitely going to be sending him a, a note. Uh, this story here was kind of a shocker, but uh, drunk cop crashes truck pulling a dare trailer. <laughs> so uh, this is almost as good as the cops that called in saying they were dying because they'd eaten some uh, medical marijuana cookie, uh, brownies. Uh, John Newcomb, 38, a member of the Seymour, Indiana Police Force and resource officer, was arrested for, uh, let's see, OWI, o o anyway, Wednesday night around 10.30 p.m. This reportedly after a crash had occurred while he was driving a pickup truck pulling the, pu pickup truck pulling the Seymour Police Department DARE, Drug Abuse Resistance Education Trailer. I grabbed the phone and called 911, said nearby resident Scott Robbins. The damage to the truck and the way it looked, the way it looked wrapped in a tree, it had to be traveling so fast. Indiana State Police are investigating. Indiana State Police say Newcomb was driving through Salem, Indiana on Main Street when he crashed. He sideswiped a vehicle that was legally parked on the side of the roadway, said Jerry God Good uh, Gooden of the uh, State Patrol, after striking that vehicle, he went on and struck a tree. He was sitting on the wall, he was sitting on the wall out of the vehicle holding his head, Robbins, uh, said Robbins' wife, Tina. Newcomb refused medical treatment after the crash, looks as though he may have needed some. He is charged with operating while intoxicated based on a reported uh, BAC, uh, yeah, BAC of 0 .14 and was booked in the Washington County Jail. According to the Seymour Police we uh, Department website, as school resource officer, <clears throat> Newcomb is responsible for seven schools, acting as a mentor and providing students with a role model. <clears throat> the website says that Newcomb conducts lectures on narcotics and alcohol and their effects on driving. So I guess he, he knows, uh, knows about that firsthand. <clears throat> and then this was a story that I was kind of excited about, and then you'll see why I got kind of bummed out. but. Uh, the Sinekomi Pat Day for Willie Nelson was just a gag. He said the, the Sinekomi uh, Tribal Council passed a resolution declaring le uh, marijuana legal on the reservation on July 30th. The re resolution was passed Thursday on a 42 vote and is signed by Chairwoman Shelley Birch. The Seattle Times reports it appears to be an official document, but Birch says it's a gag souvenir the tribe wants to frame and present to Willie Nelson when he performs that day in the tribe's Sinekomi Casino. Nelson is scheduled to perform the following night, July 20, uh, 31st, at Northern Quest uh, Casino near Spokane. So, anyway, it was all a gag, but uh, there for briefly, we thought maybe we were making, maybe making a little bit of progress, so... Uh, I, I guess not. And this one here is a little bit uh, disconcerting. Uh, this came out July 22nd. Uh, a Rasmussen poll released this week found majority support for automatic drug testing of new welfare applicants and lesser but still high levels of support for drug testing people already receiving welfare benefits. The poll comes as a new law as uh, a new law, Florida, new Florida law mandating the suspicionless drug testing of welfare applicants and recipients is about to be implemented. Missouri has also passed a law requiring the drug testing of welfare recipients if there if there is reasonable suspicion to suspect drug abuse or drug use. Bills to drug test welfare recipients have become increasingly popular as states face tough economic times and seek ways to tighten their belts, even though it is not clear that the cost of drug testing tens or hundreds of thousands of people would be offset by the savings generated by throwing drug users off the dole. 
Such bills are also constitutionally dubious. A 1999 Michigan law subjecting welfare recipients to suspicionless drug testing was thrown out by the 6th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in 2003 when the court found that it accounted to an unreasonable search and seizure under the Fourth Amendment. But that doesn't stop politicians. And this Rasmussen poll suggests why legislatures find supporting drug testing such an enticing position. The National Telephone uh, Survey of likely voters found that 53% believe all welfare applicants should be tested before receiving uh, benefits. Another 13% only supported random drug testing, while 29% said welfare applicants should only be tested if there was a reasonable suspicion they were using drugs. That is a whopping 95% who said they thought welfare applicants should be drug tested either routinely, randomly, or upon suspicion. That high number may be an, an artifact of the poll design. The poll questions only gave those three options when respondents were asked about whether welfare applicants should be drug tested. Rasmussen polling is also reputed to tilt in the conservative direction, which could also skew the findings. But with a high number and the general meaning of these results seems clear. So, yeah, that's, uh, and then, uh, yeah, Florida uh, is the latest to do that. And uh, there's been, some, they tried in Oregon, of course, this last legislature, but it failed. But they'll be back, try it again. Uh, they're definitely tenacious and keep going and keep trying. I like to say in drug testing, the only people that benefit from drug testing are the drug testing companies. Uh, uh, drug testing to me is simply uh, guilty until proven innocent. And I maintain that that's against the, the whole idea of our country. So I don't understand why it's being so accepted, but it is. Now we have we're drug testing uh, dishwashers in restaurants. So. Uh, it just gets more and more ridiculous. And the thing I've found too over the years is that when you hear of somebody having to take a drug test, I always like to stop and ask him, well, the person that actually told you physically that you need to go in there and take your drug test, <clears throat> do they take a drug test? And only very, uh, on one hand, I could count the yes responses. <laughs> Almost always it's no, surprisingly, that the people that are telling other ones they have to go take a drug test don't have to take one themselves. So uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's the American way, I guess. I like to call the government's preoccupation with your urine. I find it a little disgusting myself. Uh, so and then we are the little brights of uh, glimmers of humor. Uh, not humor, excuse me, but hope, I should say. Uh, this is out of Florida. A federal judge ruled July 27th that Florida's drug law was unconstitutional, leaving thousands of criminal cases up in the air. U.S. District Court Mary Scriven of uh, Orlando threw out the Florida Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Law on the grounds that it violates due process because it does not require prosecutors to prove a person knew he or she possessed illegal, illegal drugs. In 2002, Florida legislatures amended the state's drug law, eliminating the requirement that prosecutors prove mens rea, which is Italian. Uh, it means criminal intent as part of obtaining a conviction. Florida was the only state in the nation to not require uh, mens rea as part of a drug conviction. Not surprisingly, Florida stands alone in its expression, express elimination of uh, of uh, men, mens rea as an element of a drug offense, Scriven wrote in her order. Other states have rejected such a draconian and unreasonable construction of the law that would criminalize the unknowing possession of a controlled substance. The ruling came in the case of Mackey Vincent Sheldon, 33, who was convicted in 2005 of drug charges in Oskello County. Sheldon, who is currently serving an 18-year prison sentence for cocaine delivery and other charges, appealed his conviction on the grounds that the jury wasn't required to consider intent in order to convict him. In his instructions to the jury in Sheldon's case, the trial judge told jurors that, quote, to prove the crime of delivery of, co of cocaine, the state must prove the following two elements beyond a reasonable doubt, that 
Mackel Vincent Sheldon delivered a certain substance and that the substance was cocaine. The state did not have to prove that he knew he was carrying or distributing cocaine or any controlled substance at all. The National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, which filed an uh, amicus Curie brief in the case pointed out that without the criminal intent requirement, a federal express delivery person who unknowingly delivers a parcel containing a controlled substance would be presumed a felon under Florida's drug law. So there's a clear indication why that law wasn't work, wouldn't work. Florida defense attorneys applauded the ruling, saying the impact could be huge. Several told the St. Petersburg Times they intended to file motions seeking dismissal of pending drug cases, citing the judge's order. In declaring the statu statu statute unconstitutional on its face, it appears that all drug prosecutions in the state are at risk, said Tampa defense lawyer Eddie Suarez. That's tough, said Tampa attorney James Fellman, who represented Sheldon. Legislators should not have written an unconstitutional law removing men's Mens rea, he said. It takes the presumption of innocence and throws, in the gar throws it in the garbage can, Feldman said. I think the legislature must immediately fix the statute, he said. This is not a close call. This is not a close call. No state has ever done this before. Legally, it's beyond the pale. And once again, that's Florida, the same one that uh, is one of the leaders in drug testing, uh, <laughs> well, for applicants, whatever the connection there is. <coughs> uh, and then back on the West Coast again, pot supporters get approval to put another recreational legalization measure before California voters. Uh, Sacramento, vote supporters of legalizing recreational marijuana will try to win over California voters again next year after the Secretary of State's office on Monday cleared them to begin circulating ballot petitions. This time they will argue that pot growers should be treated the same as vineyard owners or microbreweries. Those who grow marijuana on their own uh, use would not be taxed, but those who sell it would be regulated by the State Department of Alcoholic Beverage Control. Medical marijuana activist Steve Cubby, who is one of the key backers of the current movement, said keeping the recreation of marijuana illegal was like the federal government's prohibition of alcohol, which ended in 1933. We're repealing bad laws, he said in an interview Monday. We're creating a sales tax on the biggest crop in the state, and we're bringing it within a regulated model. <clears throat> Cubby said that the latest vote, excuse me, Cubby said the latest effort stands a better chance than Proposition 19, which fell six percentage points short of the majority vote it needed last September. That initiative would have made California the first state to legalize recreational use and sales. Voter attitudes are evolving, said Cubby, who helped write the medical marijuana law California voters approved in 1996 and was the 1998 Libertarian candidate for governor. He said his measure also stands a better chance during a presidential election. Supporters say older, more conservative voters are more likely to participate in midterm elections, while presidential elections tend to draw a broader electorate. And again, we're talking about 2012, by the way, side note here, and same thing with Oregon. And that's why uh, there's one legalization initiative that I mentioned earlier that's filed and, and, work, and gathering signatures, and there's a couple more in the works. Uh, and that's why they're shooting for 2012, and that's the reason. It's, it's, it's a, a better year to, to try to uh, uh, get it on the ballot. Uh, <clears throat> it says, on Monday, the Secretary of State's office said proponent, uh, Proponents can begin gathering the 504,000 signatures they'll need to collect by December 19th. That's, that's mind-boggling. That's a half a million signatures in a little less than six months, or about six months. That's a, uh, to put the initiative on the June or November ballots next year. The timing, the timing depends on how quickly the signatures are submitted and verified, although Covey said proponents plan to, to submit uh, revisions that would likely push the measure to the November general election. Opposition opponents say legalization could lead to increased addiction, drug drivers, and a clash with federal drug agents. Critics also said that last year's proposal, if voters had approved it, would have created a patchwork of marijuana policies by letting local governments permit and tax commercial cultivation and sales. Cubby, Cubby's proposal would require statewide regulation. 
So, let's see, oh yeah, for, for the, uh, former Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger last year signed a bill making possession of up to one ounce of marijuana an infraction or more, no more serious than a speeding ticket. Reducing the crime from a misdemeanor to an infraction means offenders no longer face arrest, do not have to appear in court, and do not have a criminal record. So we work, we definitely wish them uh, all kinds of luck on, on getting that one through. Uh, and, uh, uh, of course, Oregon too, but... Uh, at least we have the initiative process. Not every state has the initiative process, and we are lucky in Oregon and California and Washington <laughs> uh, to have the initiative process, even though the legislature keeps trying to gut it and make it harder and harder to gather signatures. Uh, we still do have it, and they haven't killed it yet, but not for their lack of trying. And another thing I just found, I really, uh, and I was really excited about, I'm anxious to spread the news to my elderly mother, myself here, uh, the website is thesilvertour.org. The Silver Tour mission is to educate and inform seniors on the benefits and exciting discoveries in the medical cannabis field and to encourage activism for legalization and create demand for safe access. Seniors vote and they talk to their representatives. The Silver Tour, the Silver Tour is uh, being brought by Normal and High Time Senior Alliance. This tour features Robert uh, Plantshorn and passionately referred to uh, as Bobby Tuna. Bobby's story is so remarkable that he is featured in the blockbuster movie The Square Grouper by Magnolia Film and authored the book Black Tuna Diaries. Virtually all of the major organizations have neglected the most important national voting block. California 19 and initiatives were defeated because those with the greatest need, seniors, voted 65% against it. So we need to reach out to our seniors, and uh, I mentioned I want to talk to my mother about this. She's definitely already a supporter, doesn't use it herself, but believes in for medical use, and also the freedom of people to use things, but she'll be excited to hear that uh, they're going to reach out to seniors. So I appreciate you being here, and again, this is Dank. I'm your host with the Eugene Cannabis TV. Uh, we're filmed in the studios at CTV 29 and Sheldon, behind Sheldon High School. Every Monday at 4 o'clock, come on by and say hi. Thanks a lot. I think I'm having an overdose of so is my wife. Overdose of what? Marijuana. I don't know if it had something in it. Can you please send rescue? Do you guys have fever or anything? No, I'm just, I think we're dying. Oh, how much did you guys have? I, I don't know. We made brownies, and I think we're dead. Time is going by really, 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 really slow. <laughs> well, instead of...